his undergraduate work there in electrical engineering. He came to the United States and uh, did his master's degree in electrical engineering just up the road at Kelsey Long Beach and did his doctorate in biological engineering at the University of Missouri where he studied electromagnetic wave propagation in muscle tissue uh, to look at how the order muscle striation uh, affects uh, light propagation. He then went um, to the University of Alberta and attended worked in Roger Sims' group on photoacoustic imaging. And he's been working with myself and the rest of the virtual photonics team, Dr. Spanier, uh, Dr. Hai Cohen, focusing on innovating new methodologies for modeling um, light propagation in cells and tissues on this microscopic scale and figuring out the development of new numerical methods uh, that are much more computationally efficient in looking at how, how scattering structures within cells and tissue modify focused beam propagation with the eventual application uh, being to improve uh, optical microscopy techniques and extract more quantitative information. And so he's going to provide a complementary uh, talk for, uh, to discuss elect uh, first EM wave propagation in transparent media and how one can model uh, the distortions and phase distortions and uh, amplitude diminishment due to optical scattering. So we'll have to Thank you, Watson. <coughs> Turn off these slides. Oh, sure. yep. okay. So during this lecture, uh, okay. So during this lecture, uh, you will understand the need of uh, focus beam computational models, and then uh, I will go over concept, equations, and principle applied to. Uh, focus beam um, propagation and then uh, we are going to talk about uh, wave propagation in scattering media and Huygens Prenner principle. Uh, once we have all these basic components, uh, I'm going to discuss how we can combine all those things to uh, develop focus beam propagation model uh, in a scattering media. Uh, so in non-scattering media, uh, we'll have a plane wave incident upon a lens and then it becomes a, converge, a converging spherical wave and propagate toward the focus and then it diverge. So we'll have a high intensity uh, focal volume, uh, focal point at the focal volume. And, uh, for non-scattering medium, we can model this one. There's analytical solution to model this one. So we can model different kind of microscopy using this analytical solution. Now the problem is when we do this one in a scattering medium. So we can have different kind of scatterers. Once this focus beam uh, incident upon a scatterer, this uh, focus beam is going to distort. Depending on the size and shape of scatterer and density of scatterer, this distortion is going to be different. Now uh, our idea is to model this situation so that we can uh, model different scenarios and uh, we can apply that one to solve different problems. I'll come to that one. What are the uh, problems we are having? Uh, so the, first I want to translate from tomorrow, uh, sorry, yesterday's uh, lecture and also uh, uh, the rest of the week we are going to talk about uh, light propagation in different tissues. So I'm going to uh, combine that one with my lecture. So first case, uh, let's say we take this kind of a simple skin model with two layer model and we can use a pencil beam and we know all the information. We know the thickness, uh, uh, scatter, uh, scattering number density, refractive index and layer thickness. Uh, can we calculate uh, reflectance and transmission in this case, the first one? And then the second one is collimated beam. We are going to learn collimated beams tomorrow in detail. So when we have that case, can we calculate transmission and reflectance? Yes, we can for those two cases. We can 
calculate uh, those uh, uh, transmission and reflectance because we have models. We can use Monte Carlo simulation, can use uh, delta P, uh, P1 uh, model. Or we have different models for different cases depending on thickness. We have some limitations. Uh, but we have models for uh, models to solve uh, those two cases. But we, when we come to focus speed, we have uh, this problem. Do we have efficient model to calculate transmission and reflectance? So that is our problem. So in this image also, uh, once we go uh, beyond certain depth, uh, especially in this area, you can see uh, the Im image is blur. We don't get enough information from the bottom because of the scattering. So uh, we need to uh, think about mitigate scattering such that we can get more information from the bottom. How do you do that one? So in uh, uh, regular tissue models, when we have this, that kind of problem, we try to model that one, and then we try to uh, change different parameters and try to find the optimum uh, case uh, uh, so that we can use the information of scattering or absorption to understand that tissue. But in this case, we don't have a model to uh, 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 model this thing such that uh, 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 we don't know how to mitigate the scattering. Especially uh, if we know how to, uh, if, uh, if we know uh, how to illuminate this in a different way or use different detectors such that we can avoid scattering or uh, we can mitigate the scattering, uh, we, we can better understand these models, uh, these uh, tissue samples. So, uh, I think because of that, we need uh, efficient models uh, for uh, in my uh, focus beam propagation. So the first thing is let's look at uh, existing focus beam uh, propagation models. So, uh, the Monte Carlo simulation is the uh, basic uh, uh, but powerful focus beam propagation model. Initially, uh, uh, in initial models, we use a focus beam where photons are launched from the surface of the uh, tissue and then we propagate to the focus. But in this case, we ignore the wave nature of light because this tissue sample is thin. So the uh, electromagnetic wave is dominating in thin samples, but we ignore the uh, wave nature of light at the beginning. Uh, but in later models, this wave nature of light is included after electric field uh, Monte Carlo simulation was developed. Uh, this wave nature of light was included into Monte Carlo simulation models, but uh, still this provides the mean behavior of the sample, not like the specific uh, distortion. If you take things sample, the scatter location is specific. They are not randomly distributed. Uh, they are randomly dis distributed, but in Monte Carlo simulation, we, you consider uh, uh, it, uh, the particles are random so that uh, it is not uh, depending on the uh, specific uh, scatter location. So the results provide the mean behavior. It's not the specific. Uh, 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 it's not uh, results of a specific uh, tissue uh, structure. And also in Monte Carlo simulation, you need large number of uh, photons. In this case, you, you need to launch large number of photons from the bottom on whole surface. So it takes time. And other method is, this is the gold standard. Uh, uh, to solve electromagnetic propagation. It's called finite difference time domain solution for Maxwell's equation. So in this one, we solve Maxwell's equation rigorously in a voxelized space. Uh, so when we have a, a domain, we define that domain with voxels 
and this uh, the size of the voxel has to be small uh, to get a uh, accurate and steady uh, uh, solution. So the, normally uh, for this type of uh, simulations, the voxel size has to be uh, lambda by 20 or smaller. Uh, uh, so because of this small voxel size, we need uh, enormous computational resources. If you model 15 by 15 by 50 micron uh, volume, we, uh, to store that data, we need uh, 12 gigabyte, and uh, oh, uh, it takes 500 hours to simulate that one. So it is not practical uh, for some researchers uh, when they don't have enough computational resources. Uh, this is not practical. Uh, so, uh, and other problem is in this voxelized space, we need to define different object. If we have scatters, we need to define that object in the voxelized space. Uh, you can see uh, if you uh, define a sphere in voxelized space, there are some uh, steps uh, at the edges. So this will provide staircase errors. So the, uh, there are some issues with FTDD, but uh, this one is the gold standard uh, right now. Uh, but uh, because of this, uh, enormous computational resource requirement, uh, we, we have some issues. So our idea is to develop efficient uh, computational model so that we can uh, do simulations quickly and get results quickly uh, so that we, uh, we don't need to use the, this type of uh, uh, models. For this lecture, I decided to define this problem. This is our modeling problem. Uh, we have single scatterer, so the focus beam is propagating uh, toward the focus. We have only single scatterer. That scatterer is a spherical scatterer. So we want to know the distortion in xy plane and xz plane. And these planes are defined at the nominal focal point. So this is our modeling problem. And uh, so, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm trying to solve this problem. Uh, first, yeah, since this is a spherical scatterer, uh, we are going to look at plane waves incident on spherical scatterer. And we will understand that process. And then we will look at focus beam propagation in free space. We will look at that analytical solution. Once we have those information, then we are going to combine uh, those information and look at how we can uh, solve our problem. So I'm going to go over uh, electromagnetic wave, uh, Maxwell's equation, uh, plane wave solutions to uh, s solution to Maxwell's equations, and properties of plane wave. Okay, light is an electromagnetic wave. So in an electromagnetic wave, we have an electric field and magnetic field. They are perpendicular to each other. And then uh, the propagation direction is perpendicular to electric field and magnetic field. Uh, distance between two peaks uh, is known as the wavelength. Uh, and uh, so this magnetic wave is propagating and also oscillating at the same time. Maxwell's, Maxwell's equation provides exact model for electromagnetic wave propagation. Uh, it is a theoretical foundation of optics and it can model uh, wave interference, diffraction and polarization. So let's look at this uh, Maxwell's equation. Uh, I think you may have come across these things before but let's go over. Uh, in Faraday's law, it says uh, when there's a changing magnetic field that sustain uh, electric field. Uh, in Ampere's law, when there's a changing electric field, uh, that will produce a magnetic field. In third law, in Gauss law, uh, when you get a, a closed surface, the charges inside that closed surface 
define the electric field in that uh, on that surface. And in fourth law, net magnetic field equals to zero. That means if you take a closed surface, the magnetic field coming in goes out. The net magnetic field on that surface uh, is zero. So when you look at free space. Uh, Okay, in the second law, in addition, uh, that current also produces a magnetic field. So, uh, when there's no flow of current or no free charges in free space, uh, we can uh, simplify these equations like that. And then we can combine first equation and second equation, and we can get the wave equation. So, this is the wave equation. I'm, uh, going a little bit faster because I think we, you have come across these things uh, before. So when you have uh, that wave equation, or oh, we can come up with uh, different solutions, and uh, that solution will have a general form. It's a function of r minus c t, uh, position minus c t. If you get any function with that form, that is a solution for the wave equation. Now, uh, here we uh, are using plane wave solution. Uh, in plane wave solution, we can get a, a periodic function, either cos function or sine function. Uh, it has that same form, cos uh, k uh, z minus c t. Uh, that is the plane wave solution. So that, that's how we come up with the plane wave solution. And k is the wave number and omega is the uh, angular frequency. Now, uh, as we are not uh, considering time dependent uh, wave propagation, we can ignore this omega t in uh, next uh, discussion. Uh, so when you take that uh, EZ, uh, the amplitude is E naught, the phase is Kc minus, uh, minus omega t. And uh, in the electromagnetic wave, where we can calculate intensity, it is proportional to E naught squared. So that means even though the magnetic field is there, uh, we can only work with elect uh, electric field uh, for uh, intensity calculation. And we can get uh, uh, the same equation for magnetic uh, field also. But uh, here on, we are going to concentrate on electric field and uh, because intensity is proportional to electric field squared. So uh, when we have this plane wave, uh, this original function, it only provide the uh, amplitude at a certain uh, point, certain uh, location at certain time. So we, we need to know the amplitude and phase at the same time. To do that, do that we represent this uh, uh, equation as a complex vector. In a complex vector, uh, there's a real component an imaginary component. A real component is cosine of this one, this E naught, E naught cosine Kz, omega, uh, Kz minus omega t. And uh, the real part is sine of that one, E, e naught sine Kz minus omega t. So once we represent this uh, plane wave function in this form, we can calculate the amplitude because cos squared plus sine squared equals to 1. When you get the square root of that one, that will be equal to E naught. So that gives amplitude. And the, we can divide imaginary part by a real part. That gives the tangent. And when you calculate arc tangent, that gives the uh, argument of uh, this function. Uh, that is the phase. So we can calculate K, uh, amplitude and phase when we uh, define this plane wave function in a complex form. And uh, we can write this one in this form, E naught times exponential i phi. 
is i is the uh, com, uh, i means complex value. So whenever there's a i uh, inside exponential value, that means it's a uh, it's a phase. Um, it's not like an exponential function. Uh, this function is rotating around uh, this complex form. So this is Euler's formula, and I'm going to use this one uh, in next part of my lecture. So next thing is the polarization of plane wave. Polarization is described by uh, specifying uh, orientation of the electric field. So in this one, the, this is this red one is the electric field. Uh, it shows uh, it's oriented along x direction. So this is uh, like horizontal polarized light. And uh, so the, when you take Ex, uh, the polarization is along this direction. And we can consider different planes to define the polarization. If we define xz plane, that means this xz plane, then this uh, electric field lies on that field. So the oscillation happens on that field. So th uh, the, uh, then we can define electric field parallel to that plane. Uh, that is equal to Ex. And we can uh, calculate that uh, Ex. And then Ey, uh, sorry, uh, we, can get the, we can calculate the perpendicular electric field. That means uh, whatever the plane we consider, the uh, then we can get the per, per, plane perpendicular to that one. That is our perpendicular plane. And that is equals to Ey, it is equal to zero. And same thing we can consider Yz plane. So this Yz plane, when you consider that plane, uh, the plane, uh, the electric, uh, sorry, polarization parallel to that field is zero and polarization uh, perpendicular to that uh, plane is uh, Ex. So these are the basic things uh, uh, about wave and plane wave. Uh, and do you have questions up to here? This Polarization of plane wave, uh, Maxwell's equations, and these are fundamentals. So I went a little bit fast in this area. Okay. So now, in this case, uh, let's imagine uh, the plane wave incident on a, uh, upon a scatterer. And then we will get a, a scattering field. And we want to consider the uh, scattering field along this W direction, so along this direction. And then we will have uh, electric field parallel and perpendicular uh, to U and V. So we need to find what is the in incident component, uh, uh, incident field component on U and V for this uh, polarization calculation. So the v, we have this incident uh, upon the scatterer, but after scattering, uh, uh, it is propagated along W direction. We need to find the uh, EU and EV. For that one, we have to use this rotation matrix. So uh, this is like projecting polarization into two different uh, axes. Once you do this rotation uh, matrix calculation, we can calculate EU and EV. Uh, those are our parallel and perpendicular fields. So now we have all the basic information. Uh, we are going to look at the Mi solution to Maxwell equation, commonly known as Mi theory. And also the me simulator GUI uh, you're going to use uh, this afternoon. So in, in this case, the plane wave incident upon a spherical scatterer. 
and it created a field. Uh, so it created a uh, scattering field. And uh, this outside field is known as external field. And also uh, there's a field inside the scatterer because of dipole movement uh, uh, that is known as internal field. So this inter summation of internal field and external field is equal to the uh, incident field. Using that relationship, uh, we can uh, get a, a solution, uh, analytic solution to Maxwell equation. It is known as me solution. And this uh, incident field is a plane wave. So it is not a focus beam or a spherical uh, uh, wave or any other thing. This is a plane wave incident. So me solution is defined for a plane wave incident. If we want to use any other type of incident, uh, we have to define that one, uh, we have to modify this me solution for that uh, different incident field. So me solution described uh, electromagnetic waves scattering by a sphere and uh, this solution is a conversion in finite series. So the, this uh, incident field is defined as a, uh, in finite spherical harmonics and external field is defined as a spherical uh, infinite series of spherical harmonics, same as the uh, uh, internal field. And uh, after that we uh, solve that one and calculate uh, coefficients. Yeah. Oh. How you define the internal field, external field, and incident field? Okay. So. Initially, we don't know external field and internal field. So what we do is we, we use spherical harmonics and uh, define a field. The, so the, uh, this external field is a, a spherical wave. It's going out. Then internal field also a spherical wa uh, wave starting from the center goes, goes towards the boundary. And the external field starts from the boundary and goes outside. Okay. So we can define those one as spherical harmonics, but we have a lot of unknowns in this uh, whole infinite series. All the, uh, the coefficients are unknown, but they are uh, coefficient of spherical harmonics. So we can write equations for that one, the for, for spherical wave, outgoing spherical wave for internal field, outgoing spherical wave for uh, external field, and then we can make the, uh, use this relationship and create the equation then we can find uh, those unknown coefficients. That's how we solve that. So the, uh, you, can get, you can see how they did this one in these references, uh, Van de Hal's book and uh, Warren and Hoffman's book. They explain how, how we uh, calculate those coefficients after defining this one as uh, spherical harmonics. Okay, uh, so me solution gives us scattering efficiency. Uh, so these are the uh, coefficient we calculate. Uh, normally they are known as A n and V n. Uh, these are in spherical harmonics. So we we can get solutions for A n, A n and V n, uh, and can substitute into this equation and calculate scattering efficiency. Once we know a scattering efficiency, we can multiply that one by uh, cross-section area and calculate the scattering cross-section. And in addition to that, uh, me a solution also provides scattering amplitude, uh, compo uh, amplitude matrix component, S1 and S2. Uh, this is the equation. 
and the profile is something like that, the S1 and S2 profile. Depending on the size of the scatter, these profiles are different. So this is far field amplitude scattering matrix component. This is, uh, these are the ones we commonly come across, the far field one. Uh, actually, me solution is not limited to far field calculation. It can calculate a field at any location, even uh, right next to the sphere. So it uh, we can calculate the uh, amplitude matrix component in near field and far field. But these are the commonly used component, the far field amplitude matrix component. And also, we can calculate the phase function uh, once we have S1 and S2. Uh, this is the relationship of a phase function. So, Janika, I just wanted um, to try and make a connection with this slide and the slide I presented yesterday. Um, yesterday, I presented a general scattering amplitude matrix, right? That mm -hmm. goes, are you coming to that in just a minute? This one, yeah. Well, I, I showed the general matrix of how the incident field is multiple, the parallel and perpendicular comp electric field. Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that one. Okay, okay. Okay. Multiplied by the scattering matrix gives you the, the scattering. Yeah, yeah. Come. So in this one, uh, the scattering efficiency, the wasn't defined in different way yesterday. So the, in the, that one, you get the effective scattering electric field amplitude divided by incident electric field amplitude. So that's the efficiency. And then once you get that one, you need to multiply that one by uh, scattering cross section to get the uh, scattering cross section. Scattering cross section, I, th I think I've got right. That's basically the reduction of power you know, at the point past the scatter. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I'm not sure I can wrap my mind around scattering efficiency. I mean, I guess it's just related to it. But then there's this co complicated coefficient in there too. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. This is how we calculate that one. So if there's no scattering, scattering efficiency is zero. So the yeah, so no if there's no scattering, that means scattering efficiency is zero. So when the, uh, when, that means when you have a bigger scatterer, the scattering field is going to be stronger. So the scattering efficiency increases. So it uh, can correlate in that way. So the, uh, the size of uh, scatterer matters and also the refractive index difference between the medium and the scatter matters. So when those differences are bigger, that's going to create a large scattering field uh, along that direction. So the incident field is, uh, uh, the ratio between incident field and that scattering field pro gives uh, scattering efficiency. Okay. But it's, a, it's a scalar value. So it scalar value. Past the yeah. So the, yeah. The, this is uh, like the whole series. So the whole, it can consider whole uh, uh, phase. I mean the scattering field, the total scattering field. Yeah. Just for clarification, you've got you've got two A's here. They're they're different, aren't they? Yeah. So this one uh, is the radius. Radius. Particle. Particle, yeah. Okay. Particle radius. And, and the AN and BN are just coefficients. This AN and BN are coefficient. Okay. And um, in, in your definition of the coefficients, uh -huh. um, what are all those? <laughs> okay, these are spherical harmonics. The M is the uh, ratio between uh, the scatterer refractive index versus medium refractive index. And this is a, uh, so the coefficient of spherical harmonics are different the, the, in uh, this one, uh, not the coefficient, the argument. So in this one, it is Mx, this, uh, this is x in this case. And this is the first derivative of spherical harmonics, uh, the dash means First derivative, and uh, what is that? Uh, 
Ricard, uh, Bessel function, uh, I can't remember the exact name, it's a Riccardi Bessel function, uh, you can represent those spherical so harmonics as the expansion. expansion of spherical harmonics. Yeah. I'll just add that he has in very fine print a reference to a web link called scatport.org. So there, there's wonderful software. You don't have to code any of this. It's available freely to everyone. For me, solution, although it's laborious, it's, yeah. it's a great demand and great interest. So if you ever want to make these calculations, you can download the free piece of software. And actually, who you're going to be working with today actually does all this stuff. Yeah, you can download them. Um, you, you, you may be diff working in MATLAB or C or different languages, so they have codes in e uh, different languages. You can download them and then use for your work. So the, this is a good reference, this is catport.org. And also they have the explanation, especially if you look at these two books, uh, that's the best reference. Okay, so this is a uh, me simulator GUI we developed. Actually, this one was developed for this course uh, two years ago, and uh, uh, because um, for Tuesday afternoon we need me simulation and focus beam simulation. So uh, this is one of the software you're going to use this afternoon. Uh, this panel uh, is for inputs, and then uh, in this panel. Uh, Using that equation, you can calculate scattering cross section. Once you have scattering cross section and this number density, uh, multiplication of scattering cross section and number density provide the scattering coefficient. And then uh, uh, you can remember the equation for phase function. So we can calculate the phase function and then get the cosine of that one and average that one that provides G. Once you have mu s and g, you can calculate mu s prime. That's how this uh, tool was organized. So uh, you can uh, use mono disperse and poly disperse and calculate uh, uh, scatter, uh, scattering coefficient, reduce scattering coefficient, uh, phase function, and g using this tool. And also, uh, yesterday Watson talked about uh, how to uh, get the um, uh, fitting coefficient uh, using uh, Steve Jack's uh, fitting function. So in this tab, you can do that. You can get a mu s uh, prime curve and then uh, calculate the fitting functions. Okay, uh, yeah. I was just wondering if you could work backwards from mu, mu s prime and get g and mu s. No. no. Uh, when you say number density, is that the number density of particles, I guess? Yeah, number density of particles. So you know. In a given volume, in this one it is one uh, cubic millimeter. In given volume, how many particles uh, within that volume? That's the number density. Okay, uh, really limit of mean scattering. So when the diameter of scatter is, is much smaller than the wavelength, then the scattering coefficient is proportional to uh, the radius a fourth power of radius divided by fourth power of lambda. So this this is important in uh, Rayleigh scattering. So the, uh, if you uh, get the a by lambda and then you can put the fourth power separately, that means this when you keep that ratio constant, the scattering coefficient is going to be constant. So uh, you can double the uh, uh, particle size if you double the wavelength then you get this, you end up with same uh, scattering coefficient, uh, scattering efficiency, scattering efficiency. And then uh, you have to multiply by 
scattering cross sections to get the uh, cross section of the scatterer to get the scattering cross section, uh, then the things will be different because you have a different radius now. So in uh, Rayleigh scattering, the wavelength is much bigger than the particle diameter, so there will be a single dipole, and uh, Mahela explained the dipole radiation, so the, the, there will be a single dipole, and this kind of a dipole uh, is known as Hertzian dipole, and uh, let's look at the parallel and polarization in uh, Rayleigh region. So, uh, so we have this incident, the, it is polarized in this direction, and it uh, pro uh, the incident is propagating in this direction, and the scatter is right there, and it will provide this kind of a donut shape of uh, polarization profile. So this, this uh, radiation pattern, once you uh, consider the three dimension of this uh, radiation profile, it's going to be this kind of a donut. And when we want to look at the parallel polarization, that means the, uh, the polarization parallel to the incident plane. So this is the polarization, the plane parallel to that one is YZ plane. So you can cut that one, then you get this kind of two lobes. And uh, that's what we have seen for parallel polarization. So in this one, uh, the zero degrees here, but in the me simulator GUI, zero degrees there, 180 degrees here. Uh, so you get a 90 degree shift. And uh, for perpendicular polarization, this is your parallel plane. Well, Z, y, YZ plane is a par, uh, plane parallel to the incident polarization. The perpendicular polarization is parallel to that one. That means XZ plane. So you can cut along XZ plane then you will end up with this kind of a circle. This is why we get different profiles for uh, polarization, the, this kind of two lobes and circular profile. Yeah. I'm a little confused by the cartoon. So the electric field is oscillating in Y, and then the wave is oscillating in Y? Or is that the uh, Yeah, yeah, along Y. No, it, it, it is propagating in Z. Propagate the pro, this is the oscillation direction. So the, uh, the Y is the oscillation direction. And then, uh, let me go back to this one. Okay. So in this one, this is the oscillation direction. So X direction is the oscillation direction, but it is propagating toward the Z direction. So it's propagating in this direction. So same thing happens here. So the, it is oscillating along Y direction in this case. So the, the sinusoidal is in this way. And uh, it is propagating along Z direction. So the, it's oscillating in this direction. The, this is the sinusoidal and uh, it generates that kind of a uh, uh, for, uh, radiation because of this oscillation. There's a negative and positive dipole and then uh, dipole radiation. So, Janica, maybe I could clarify. So, the uh, electric field oscillation is in the plane of the, of the screen. Plane of the, the screen. screen is defined by the YZ. Okay, so, so for parallel polarization, so he's cutting that donut, so to speak, a slice of the YZ plane centered at the origin. Okay, so that's why you get the lobe structure. For the perpendicular, what he's do denoted actually is, we've actually kept the oscillation in the same. plane, but the perpendicular component is really the XZ plane. So and that's what he's done the cross-section of, and that's why you have a circular pattern. He could have done something slightly different. And yeah, I thought so about that, but uh, the, the incident uh, is going to be the same, but our, the way we are looking at it is going to be the different. First time we are going to look at the parallel one, next time we are going to look at the plane perpendicular to that parallel plane. Okay, 
time. So now, <laughs> so then, what it, what exactly is this pattern? This is the electric field after the scatter, or what? This is this is the scattering field actually. This is this is the so if particle is small, its scattering pattern is going to be uh, like this. This kind of a donut pattern. It's uh, much smaller than the wavelength. But uh, when it is getting bigger, uh, this top part is going to be bigger. We have more forward scattering, and the bottom part is going to be smaller. So this part is going to be smaller, this is going to be bigger because instead of single dipole, we have multiple dipoles within that uh, particle and that create uh, constructive and destructive interference. So, any other questions? Okay, so now uh, we have this uh, expolarized incident we can represent as this kind of a wave front and then uh, it incident upon the scatterer and it uh, generate this kind of a scattered field. Let's consider this one is a little bit bigger so the, uh, the scattering field looks like this but if you consider the whole field it's going to be around that particle, it's a spherical wave. So we want to find the electric field at location A, I define A here. So we want to find the scattering field at this location A. And our incident, polarized, uh, incident field is polarized along x direction. And the first thing we need to do is we need to calculate what is the incident component along that plane and parallel to that plane. So this is the plane we are interested in. Uh, this is the A location. So we need to find this EI parallel and EI uh, perpendicular, these two components. To do that one, we apply that rotation matrix and calculate E uh, parallel and E perpendicular incident component at this point. So this is the incident component. So the, because of this incident component uh, on this particle, that generates a scattering field. So consider uh, this phi is 90 degrees. This angle is 90 degrees then cos 90 is 0 and there will be no parallel component. Only perpend we have only perpendicular component. This is, this is 0, there is no contribution from that one because of this is 0. Uh, so first thing is we need to find what is the incident uh, contribution uh, along that plane. And then the scattered field the scattered field uh, uh, from this particle is given by this equation. So in this equation, this is a, a spherical wave. In spherical wave, you have 1 over uh, r component. That means the intensity is uh, decreasing with the distance. And we use kr, so it's dimensionless. And here's exponential i kr, when there's i within this exponential that means it is a phase. So this represents the phase. This is phase uh, change at distance r. If we start from zero phase, after traveling r distance, this is what we get. And then we multiply by the amplitude uh, scattering matrix component calculated from V theory. And then this is the incident uh, contribution for the parallel component. Same thing for the perpendicular component. So the, uh, you can see this is a spherical wave. So the, the 1 over uh, KR component is there. And I'll come to a different uh, uh, propagation that is converging spherical wave. In that one, this KR part is on the top because the energy uh, in convergent spherical wave and the spread energy is trying to converge into a point, so this part will be on the top. 
So we can uh, calculate the scattering uh, electric field, uh, the parallel electric field and perpendicular electric field uh, using this equation. So in this one, this S1 and S2 uh, is depend, uh, it's, they are depend on R and theta, not only theta. In far field, it only depend on theta, but in uh, this case, it depend on R and theta. So we can calculate electric field at near locations, and after a uh, certain distance, we can use the far field uh, S1 for this case. Any questions up here? Okay, then, so this is for spherical component. For non-spherical scatterers, this is the complex thing. So the, uh, imagine we want to uh, model a collision as cylinders or uh, mitochondria as spheroids or different kind of shapes. Then we have to use this, uh, this amplitude matrix component and this one that depends on uh, distance, theta, and phi because uh, for non-spherical scatterers, uh, it is phi dependent. It is not symmetric around phi. Now, when we consider electric field at this location A, uh, we calculated scattering field then the incident field is going to propagate towards this location because nothing is going to stop that one. So while at this location, we have to interfe interfere the scattering field and incident field. So once we interfere scattering field and incident field, we will get the actual, the final electric field at this location. Now, uh, the problem is, these are vectors. So we, we have this E ink here, uh, the incident electric field, and these three components. These uh, vectors are oriented in different directions. So to calculate the final vector, we need to add three vectors and find the final vector. That may be oriented in different directions. But we need some kind of a standard for that. Uh, we are going to calculate the, scatter, uh, the electric field in, uh, along x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis. To do that one, we do the vector decomposition. So we uh, define this uh, incident electric field uh, along i means x-direction, j means y-direction, k means uh, z-direction, uh, along different directions. And we can do the same thing for parallel component and perpendicular component. So we will have different component along uh, x, y, and z direction. Once we have all these components along that, that direction, we can add all these components and calculate the Ex electric field, and then Ey and Ez. This is how we uh, get the uh, total electric field. Uh, as a different component. If we want to get the amplitude of uh, the electric field, we get the square root of uh, Ex squared plus Ey squared plus Ez squared. That's how we calculate the amplitude at uh, this location. Do you have any questions about this one? So the important thing is we have a scattering field, uh, scattered field at this location, but incident field is going to propagate to this location. So that's why I think uh, Tom asked a question about this phase. Why phase is different when, there's a, when there are scatterers? So be, that is, this is the reason. So you have this incident field, but because of uh, this scattered field, it will create a different electric field. Interference of those two fields change the phase. Okay, uh, until now we uh, check only single scatterer. What happens if we have 
two scatterers. So we have this scatter here and the second scatter at that location. So we have contributions from this one and contributions from that one. Now, in addition, because of the scattering field, this one generates another scattering field because this scattering field is going to uh, affect this particle and that will generate another scattering field. So, we, uh, we can take this condition. So, the, uh, there are two scatterers. The primary scattering uh, field at uh, location A is the direct, uh, because of that incident field, this will have a scattering field effect uh, at A and the second particle has a scattering field effect at A. Uh, that is the primary scattering. The secondary scattering is the second particle will have scattering field effect on uh, scatter one and then because of that it will generate another scattering field. So this is secondary scattering. But these are spherical uh, uh, spherical waves. So you know spherical wave are uh, depend on 1 over r. So their energy dissipate as it propagates. So this amplitude is going to be much smaller and the, because of that this scattering field effect is smaller. But when we go to the tertiary scattering, uh, so the, in that case the first one has a scattering field effect on this direction because of that there is a backward scattering and then uh, that will create another scattering field on the location A. Uh, this is an interesting case. So in a uh, Rayleigh limit, uh, the scattering field intensity is going to be so small. So the, w w when you consider the backward scattering effects uh, from the second particle, it's going to be quite small. And if you consider bigger particle, then the because of this field, the scattering field is going to be forward scattering. So there is a small scattering effect on backward direction. So the uh, the backward effect is going to be small, so this uh, effect is going to be quite small. So we can neglect the, this uh, tertiary scattering. We can consider primary and secondary scattering uh, for uh, this kind of a multi-scatter case. And according to superposition theorem, the electric field at location A is equal to uh, the incident scattering field plus uh, scattering field of uh, each scatter. Yeah. Um, so, do you then also account for the interference between all these fields? Yeah, this addition means interference actually. Okay. Yeah. The, because uh, in vectorially, the interference means vector addition. So, the, we do vector addition, but uh, addition really means interference. So in this case, we ignore absorption. So there is uh, no absorption in this case. So we only consider scattering. But uh, the, uh, what I'm saying is, uh, in the, the, this case, the secondary scattering has some effect, but tertiary scattering uh, we can ignore because uh, if particle is quite small, scattering field is small. This is like a Rayleigh scattering. So the, when you consider the backward scattering on this particle, because the secondary scattering, uh, second scattering event is this dash line, so that effect is small on this particle. So because of that small amplitude, the um, scattering field generated by this particle is going to be uh, small. And also these waves are spherical waves. So as you travel, its intensity decreases because it's, uh, it has 1 over R effect. Because you say it's it, it's a spherical, spherical wave means, so well, you can take a sphere and you can calculate the energy in that whole sphere 
and you can define another sphere with different radius and you can calculate the energy in that sphere both energy is supposed to be same so that means when you go further the intensity is going to be reduced because it has to spread in whole sphere so that's one over r effect so always it travels the intensity at this location is going to be reduced when it reaches the center of other particle Okay. okay, so we can apply the same thing for multi-particles. So when you have multiple particles, we can consider primary scattering and secondary scattering. Okay, so up to now, we look at this case. So we check the plane wave incident on spherical scatter, and now we are going to look at the focus beam propagation in free space. So we, up to now, we didn't look at the focus beam. We just look at the plane wave propagation, plane wave incident on uh, spherical scatterers. So now we're going to look at focus beam propagation in phase space. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it is not constant. Uh, it's diff I mean, depending on the direction, the, its uh, amplitude is right, going to be different. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But there's a the, each scatterer isn't emitting isotropically. Obviously, they it's are not. Yes. Yeah. If it is a small particle, yeah, yeah, you can consider it's isotropic because it's in Rayleigh region. But if it is bigger, then it's highly forward scattering. So, so actually, can you go back with the three D picture of the donut? <laughs> donut, okay. So the, now this case we have only one polarized direction but if you consider other polarization this is going to create a sphere because imagine this kind of a donut and rotate into different directions and you combine all those donuts so it will create a sphere for unpolarized light it's going to be a sphere yeah Okay, so this is a uh, focus beam propagation and you have plane wave incident on this lens and we can represent this lens as a, a spherical cap or section of a sphere uh, because this, what this lens does is it generates a, a spherical wave, a convergent spherical wave and it uh, propagates toward the focus. So well, we can replace it with this kind of a spherical cap. So the, this spherical cap generates the electric field and then it propagates toward the focus. So this is a geometrical representation of a lens. Uh, and uh, this is the analytical solution. Uh, in, let's look at this one in detail. So this first part is KF. This is a converging spherical wave. So the spherical for a spherical wave, this kr or the k and other distance parameter is, uh, is the denominator. In this one, it's a numerator. And so the energy is spread in this area and it's going to be concentrated at this focal point. So the, you have this factor. 
and then exponential and i k f i means it's uh, this represents the phase uh, k f is the distance from uh, here to the uh, focal point uh, this is the uh, phase at the focal point with respect to the lens the and then when you consider this uh, whole thing this integration this e and theta phi is the electric field on the spherical cap. This is going to be different uh, because of the polarization. We, our incident polarization is along one direction. So we can calculate this E theta phi uh, at different locations. And then that, those all locations are going to be integrated and uh, we are going to calculate the focal field, uh, field at these locations. So the, this integration does that and what this phase does is it will calculate actual phase based on its location because this is rho z dependent. Uh, um, this part calculates the phase uh, relative to the focal point and uh, we do the integration and that provides the electric field at the focus. So this is the analytical solution. And this afternoon we are going to use this focus beam simulator GUI. Uh, in that one, this second column is the analytical solution. So it only provides uh, analytical solu uh, the results from analytical simulation. Um, Numerical aperture is the uh, ang uh, cone angle of the lens. When we have low numerical aperture, we have low resolution because uh, the cone angle is small uh, and uh, uh, the area radius uh, is going to be uh, is. <laughs> Uh, going to depend on 1 over Na. So when uh, you have a low Na, uh, it will provide low resolution. When uh, it has high numerical aperture, we have high resolution images. Mahela also uh, talk about this one, the Huygens Fresnel principle. In Huygens Fresnel principle, when we consider any uh, wave, uh, we can consider any point in that on that wave front and represent that one as a spherical wave. So uh, any location we, we can generate a spherical wave. And then we, uh, that spherical wave can be decomposed into small components. We call these uh, small components as wavelets. Uh, it's a section, a small section of a wave. So these are Huygens Fresnel wavelets. Well, when they propagate in, uh, they are going to propagate in different directions and when uh, all these wavelets uh, add in another wave front, it's going to uh, give the amplitude and phase at that wave front. We can apply this one for focus speed. So same theory, what we do is we uh, generate Huygens Fresnel wavelets uh, of this uh, wave front and propagate uh, toward the uh, toward different directions where it just need to go towards the focus because uh, this is a spherical wave it can go in any direction see in uh, non scattering medium this is what is happening uh, I think you have seen this one before. Uh, so th you have this kind of Huygens Fresnel wavelets, and when they have same uh, phase profile, they are going to provide a constructive interference at this location and provide high uh, intensity at the center. But when they are in op opposite direction, the in phases are in opposite direction, the addition of those phases are going to provide a um, uh, zero or minimal intensity at that location. 
that's how airy uh, disk is produced. So this, this is for non-scattering media. So now uh, to develop our model, we uh, use that Huygen Fresnel principle. So the, we can start to uh, uh, start the electric field from this uh, spherical cap and then propagate those uh, wavelets in different direction as a Huygen Fresnel principle. This is what we did uh, in implementing Huygen Fresnel wavelets in the non-scattering medium. What we did was we generate uniformly dis distributed points uh, on the spherical cap. So we take this spherical cap and then we sample that one and we uh, have uh, uniformly distributed uh, point set on this surface. After that, we uh, look at the detector location. We, we can define the detection. Okay, we want to see the uh, intensity at certain location. We can define that position and we can project this wavelet toward that uh, location and calculate the electric field. So, the, so this equation shows how we did that one. I'm not going, uh, not going into the, the details. But the basic uh, uh, procedure is we calculate the electric field on this spherical cap and propagate toward the detector. So that's how we did in the uh, non-scattering medium. So the first thing we want to uh, uh, compare this one with analytical solution because we know analytical solution provide correct uh, results. So uh, we compare our results with analytical solution and then once we subtract those two results, uh, it's zero, almost zero. Uh, so, uh, that's how we prove this uh, technique for non-scattering media. And uh, you're going to do simulations for non-scattering medium. Uh, you're going to look at EX component, EY component, and EZ component. You can toggle around these uh, radio buttons and find EX, EY, EZ. Uh, so this one gives the analytical solution. Uh, this calculates the uh, uh, same thing using Huygen Fresnel wavelets. Now, what about when we have a scatterer? So the same thing applies. So we, when we have a scatterer, we can project this Huygen Fresnel wavelet and calculate the scattering field, and then we can find the scattering field uh, on specific location of detector and continue that. And for the secondary, uh, sec secondary scattering, we can find the secondary uh, the initial field on the second scatterer and calculate the uh, scattering field at the detector. So when we implement this one in a scattering medium, so the same thing, first we sample this one and calculate the incident field and then we project each wavelength toward the uh, scatterer and then uh, we find what is the scattering field going to be on this detector. We calculate that one. So we uh, learned this one, plane wave incident on spherical scatterer. Then we went through focus beam propagation in free space. And then uh, we came to this modeling problem and we solved this modeling problem. Let's look, sorry. Let's look at some other examples. So in this one, uh, the scatterer is at this location. It's on z-axis. This is uh, offset to the z-axis, but close to the detector or focal plane, uh, detector at the focal plane. And this one, uh, it is like 15 microns away from the focal plane. Uh, here we have two scatterers. So we have these four cases. And then we calculate the scattering amplitude. Uh, this is EX, yeah, EX, uh, using this uh, technique, Huygen Fresnel uh, uh, wavelets. And we compare that one with FTTD. Uh, we collaborate with UT Austin uh, to get this, uh, UT, 
that you are trying to get these results. And they, uh, to generate these results, uh, this, I have to run this uh, program for like 230 process hours. So, the, so we, we can get these results in like uh, two, three minutes. You can see uh, this afternoon how soon you can get these results. Uh, so we compare these results and you can see they are uh, identical. And uh, these are for two different scatterers. This is 2.5 micron scatterer. This is for 5 micron scatterer. And also we can generate this kind of 3D patterns. Uh, once we get different slides, we can generate this one. This is for non-scattering medium. Uh, this one is a medium with a scatterer. In this case, the, uh, this uh, focal volume is replaced uh, and also its amplitude is uh, amplitude change. So uh, one of the exercise is to calculate this uh, amplitude change and the displacement. Uh, so the pros of this method is it's uh, two to three orders mag uh, of magnitude faster than FTTD. Uh, we don't need high performance computer system. To run FTTD, you need high performance computer systems. Uh, otherwise, you have to wait a long time to get the results. And uh, we don't need to run through whole volume. Well, we can uh, specify the detector and calculate the electric field at that specific uh, detector. And also, uh, instead of uh, sampling uh, with high resolution that a spherical cap we can sample with high resolution instead of that we can do a low resolution sampling that means a fewer number of spot and get a quick snapshot of electric field uh, because it will reduce the time and, uh, cons are um, for thick samples so this one is uh, one or two particles but we may need to model this one for thick samples when we consider thick sample, we have to calculate electric field from each particle. We may have like 10,000 or 20,000 scatterers in that uh, thick sample. So uh, that case, uh, we may not see a huge speed gain, but we are thinking about different approach. We are thinking about uh, linear addition of uh, different layers. So instead of uh, taking whole thickness at one time, we, can, we, may think, uh, we are thinking of uh, calculating different layers, the field from different layers, and uh, interfere those uh, results. And, uh, other thing is for uh, spherical particles, it is OK because we have S1 and S2, two components, and far field we have uh, we can use far field simulation, uh, far field uh, amplitude matrix data. But uh, once we consider about different kind of shapes for uh, spheroids or cylinders, we have um, different m metrics for different set of particles. So it's going to be a huge. Uh, so this will provide Huygen Fresnel approach. You can calculate incident, uh, that is incident without scattered field. Then you can see the scattered field. And this is this uh, interference of uh, uh, incident and scattered field. So that's all. Uh, yeah, I think that, yeah, that's, that's the last one, yeah. So this is what you are going to do this afternoon. Uh, so the, the, here you can, you can see this is the detector resolution. That's where I say you can do a, uh, high resolution sampling of that spherical cap or low resolution sampling. If you increase that detector, detector resolution, uh, then it will take long time to do the simulation.
so if you're if you're propagating from a lens towards towards your object that you're trying to look at, at the focal plane, it would strike me that, that near the lens you have a very large area, essentially with a lot of structures in it. Mm -hmm. They're a long distance from the object that you're trying to image. Um, whereas when you're very close to that image, your, your beam is very tightly focused. Um, you may only have one or two scatterers, but they must have a huge effect on the light that gets to your um, object. Um, how do you use your approach? Can you use some sort of hybrid approach? Because I guess if you have hundreds of scatterers immediately after your lens and you have to track the electric field contributions forwards, um, that could be quite time consuming. Whereas if you only have one or two scatterers, you know where you're going. So this method depends on number of scatterers. So your question was, uh, how do you do that one for a small number of scatterers? This is large number of scatterers or the scatterers beyond the focal uh, region? Uh, um, uh. Well, I was just thinking that as you get closer to the focal point, you interact with less scatterers. So um, your approach is to look at all the scatterers and the entire focal and the entire volume as the beam propagates towards the for any location, we can define our detector at any location. It could be at the focal plane, it could be outside, uh, it could be at any location. So the scatter location, uh, we, what we do is we calculate the scattered field from that scatter to that, to that detector. So detector can be at any location, our interested location. I think implicit in your question is whether, given that the particles in the immediate proximity of the focal volume are likely to have the highest impact on perhaps distorting or modifying that focal field, do you have to even worry about, or, or can you get away with a less rigorous process to calculate the impact of these multitude of particles far away from the focal field, are, how important are they? Yeah, that's uh -huh. is, is yeah. that basically the question? Sir? Yeah, so I think you can do that simulation today, this afternoon. So you can put the particle at different locations. So you can, you know, you, first thing is, you can see what happened when I put particle very close to the focus. Uh, so what is my distorted field? And then you can bring that one down slowly and you can see how that scattering field is going to change. So then at certain point, there will be no effect on the focal volume of where the detector is. So, uh, yeah. John, in your Joseph paper, you actually showed some results uh, that look at, compare the focal field in the presence of a particle and without the presence of that particle and calculated either the amplitude or phase correlation. And when the correlation is high, that means it's minimally distorting that focal field. And then he plotted that scalar value of that correlation going from zero to one and then did that for all possible locations of the particle. I don't know if you have those, uh, those plots on your computer but it shows you precisely what your intuition is indicating, that as you go further and further away, the impact of a single particle on distorting the amplitude and phase becomes less and less. But the spatial pattern of that is very interesting. And uh, actually, Jonica is bringing that result up right now from a paper of ours from last year. Um, so I think it's like figure 10 or 11. Yeah, just. So, Janika, you want to explain this? So, I think yeah, on so the left-hand side is an amplitude correlation coefficient as a function of location in X and Z. So, here, we're not visualizing an electric field or a phase pattern. We're looking at a map of a correlation coefficient, where green is close to 1, meaning that you're getting minimal amplitude distortion 
and the darker colors means that you get larger amplitude distortions. And the spatial map is where the particle was placed in that ball. Uh -huh. So, so the, this green means it's uh, close to one. So when particle is at this location, there will be no effect on the focal plane. The minimal effect on the focal plane. But when it is close to this, close to two, three micron. This is 2.5 micron particle. Uh, it has a maximum. Uh, amplitude correlation coefficient. This is for the amplitude and this one is for 5 micron particle. When particle is bigger, you have to go more deeper because at 30 micron also you have said some kind of effect on the focal plane. For a small particle, 1 micron particle, beyond certain microns you don't see any effect. Uh, this is the phase. So the phase t effect is different than amplitude the, because if you have a simple change of phase, you know, this one capture that one because the, when you calculate the correlation coefficient. So the, uh, for one micron particle, around 10 micron or beyond, you don't see any effect. But if it is a 5 micron, even at um, 40 micron, you have certain correlation. So you, you can decide how far you have to go uh, for those kind of particles using this tool. So this is certainly relevant actually to the work that Janika and I are continuing to, to do is that Janika is a little too modest, but he's actually developed these codes to do this very problem where you have 10,000 scatterers occupying a volume of say 50 microns by 50 microns by 50 microns. And uh, these, take, these simulations do take couple days to run, still faster than finite difference time domain, but ultimately if we want to try and model a real tissue volume, the question is, is that can we do something more efficient? Can we actually say, if you have a 100 micron thick tissue, can you model, say, the 100 micron to minus, minus 100 to minus 50 using, say, a Monte Carlo, and then do some sort of handshake uh, between the Monte Carlo output and this finite difference time domain and then do only the rigorous simulation close up. And that's proving to be a little challenging, actually, because Monte Carlo, uh, so there are a couple things that are really important, is that the scattering amplitude matrix that he showed, one thing that he mentioned but he didn't emphasize is that the phase function is meaning the angular distribution of the scattered field is not only variation with angle, but it's variation with distance because there's a near field and then there's a far field. And this finite difference time domain or this method accommodates for that. Monte Carlo doesn't. Monte Carlo always assumes far oh. field scattering. And so there are subtle changes in phase and amplitude inaccuracies when you do a handshake between Monte Carlo and finite difference and, and, and a rigorous uh, electric field simulation. And if you have an error in phase, that phase is going to propagate all the way to through the focal volume, and that's going to give you an inaccurate result. So you know, taking care of, of your amplitude and phase is really critical because what gives rise to these patterns is the interference. And if you have errors in phase, it's going to bite you. Hopefully that clarifies. So tying back to my question from the earlier lecture, um, and, and this is a very general question, but is phase conserved? I mean, after that scattering with that spherical particle, it is it retains that phase, that instant wave. Is that? The no, the incident wave phase uh, is going to be preserved, but the scattering field is going to interfere with that one. That interference is going to change the phase. What do you mean by phase is conserved? I didn't quite understand that. Yeah, well, we talk, we're talking about lots of phase. <laughs> and when I'm talking about phase, I'm talking about the temporal coherence of the incident wave. Right? Can I, you know, I send in my, and in laser spec imaging, right, something moves, I can detect that interference because it's changing the intensity of what I see at my detector, which implies that 
when it's scattered, it's not randomizing the phase, that there is a phase correlation. So the phase isn't being randomized, but the phase is being shifted by the scattering of the particle, because the particle has a refractive index mismatch, so for a, a unit length propagation of that particle, you're going to accumulate more or less phase. And then if you interfere that scattered wave with the instant wave, now they used to be in sync, but now they're shifted. And when they're shifted relative to each other, that's going to give rise to your interference. So this is, these are modeling all coherent phenomena. Right? You're, you're modeling the interference and the diffraction. So the phase is conserved, but once the phase is shifted, it gives rise to the diffraction and interference patterns that Jonica is showing. Does that, does that? Yeah, no, because in, in my, you know, prior to this, in my naive understanding of scattering is a refractive index mismatch, and you get a reflection component and a refraction component. And when in, in the macro view, we have reflection, we have a 180 degree phase shift in that other direction. Is something similar here in terms of a directional dependence in the emission? Uh, no. uh, so the uh, yeah, I think I talk about that on the <coughs> in mean scattering. So the the incident plane wave incident upon this scatter, and then you will have a directional uh, dependent scattering field from that particle. So. Uh, different it, it is different uh, in the direction the, the wavelength of light was much smaller than the particle right that's that's just the case the, the macro case right of light impinging on the refractive index boundary right so that in that limit it should just turn into that right where something that's scattered back or we would call just reflection at an interface should be 180 degrees on phase if it's a higher so the Imagine, so the, this is like your particle, and uh, so you have a big particle and you have a, a small wavelength. So this one is vibrating. There are multiple wavelengths uh, vibrating, m multiple waves are vibrating inside this particle. So the, because of that uh, vibration, you know, there are dipoles inside this particle and generate the interference. So, uh, so this, once you have different uh, dipole radiation, you, you have to add all those uh, dipole radiations. So for bigger particles, it's always going to be forward, scatter, forward direction. So the backward is going to be minimal because of that. And because of that, uh, the dipole radiation. The, once you calculate that one, once if um, it's not exactly like that uh, 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 donut shape, it's going to be more like a big uh, top and a small bottom uh, because of that interference. You can, uh, it's hard to explain. Well, it's, uh, the, the plane wave case is most analogous in some sense to the, the, the Rayleigh limit of mean scattering, in the sense that when you have a plane wave of EM light impinging on a planar surface, all of the dipoles on that surface are kind of vibrating in synchrony with each other you have no lateral extent. And so, but what Jonica is trying to say is that when you have a particle with a size comparable to the wavelength, or larger than the wavelength, there's no synchrony in the dipoles that are oscillating. And therefore, they're all phase shifted relative to each other. And you have this very complicated uh, pattern. And when he talks about the scattering amplitude matrix, remember, it's a complex function, right? It's You have intensities that are varying with angle, and you have phases that are varying. So that's why I think that's another way of saying it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not, not simple. So I, I guess it then kind of blows my mind. So in reality, we don't have spherical particles. We've got particles that are all kinds of different shape. Um, I mean, maybe even random shapes, right? Um, so in a coherent interference-based technique like diffuse correlation spectroscopy, or laser spectral imaging, it kind of amazes me that we still see some sort of coherence or auto correlation between what we send in and what we get out after all those scattering events occur. Um, I don't know, should I not be surprised by that? Or?
several coherencies you're looking at. So there's the, there's the internal co coherence of the, there's the coherence of the light field, which is the interaction between the waves, which occurs on a wavelength. But when you're doing your coherent technique, you're modulating the field with a much slower. No, I'm not talking about intensity modulation. I'm talking about like, like it's not. I mean, you're interfering the light field against each other, right? It's it's the electric field. I'm not talking about um, you know, photon density waves, which is a, you know, a different case altogether. Tom, I, I think there are a couple issues here, and that's why I didn't immediately respond. They responded off initially. So first. When you do something like diffuse correlation spectroscopy or you do spectral imaging, the light sources you're using are quite special, right? They have very long, yeah, meter, long meter coherence. Okay, so, so um, and then you are essentially looking at the autocorrelation function, right, of the phase right, coming back. So that, I believe, is telling you what is the multiplicity of path lengths of the light coming back. Yeah. So, assuming there's not a break in the phase. Right. What I'm hearing is there's never in this. There's not a break in the phase. It's always determined. It's always related to. Right. So, you know. Professor Spanier yesterday mentioned about these three regimes, this kind of ballistic propagation regime, this transport regime, and this diffuse regime. So ultimately, I guess you're still in this kind of transport regime where some phase correlations are preserved, but they're not completely wiped out. Although I don't have a full answer to your question, because clearly the DCS works very large steps. Right, right. So, um, I don't quite, quite know how to answer that question. It's a good question. Gordon, do you have any thoughts? Any other questions in a different theme? Okay. So, um, so a couple things. The, the program today is going to be slightly different than yesterday. We're going to go over half lunch, and then at one thirty, uh, Mahela Balu will be giving you a tour and a demonstration of a couple different systems that they've developed to do big tissue imaging. One is a laboratory system, and one is a system that they use to take measurements on, on, on patients. And it's actually one of the few systems in the world that actually are able to do, um, to, it's a portable system that's, that's able to take uh, big tissue microscopy measurements and skin, which will actually give you a demonstration. And then that'll take us to about 2.15 to 30, and then you'll have a number of laboratory experiences with, with some software that John kind of has designed, um, both to look at the effects of single scatters, um, uh, the scattering and the really scattering characteristics, distributions of scatters, poly dispersed scatters, and then also looking at distributions of the classic population. So you can kind of see the classic uh, planar solutions of the first. So, uh, there are no more questions. Let's uh, head over.